Hi, my name is Marco Cantu. Welcome to this session about what's new in the Object Pascal language in Delphi XC7. I'm the Brad Studio Product Manager at Embarcadero Technologies, and this is my contact information in terms of emails, Twitter account, and my blog. So what we're going to see in this session is spend a little time do doing a short roundup of Object Pascal language features, starting with the core and spending a little time on some of the extensions that have been done over the last few years, and then focusing a little more on new recent features. About core features and the older extensions, I won't go over them in detail, because they're not new, but I'm going to show you some pretty unusual uh, coding styles you can use today in Object Pascal. So let me start with the definition. It actually does come from my book. Power and simplicity, expressiveness and readability, great for learning and for professional development alike. These are some of the traits of today's Object Pascal. A tool for all trades with compilers and development tools embracing the mobile era a language ready for the future with solid roots in the past. I think these are good definitions of the language. Of course, you can come up with others, but uh, that's how I see the language overall. Um, so again, let's start with some of the foundations. As you know, it's a strongly typed and type safe language, which is not as common these days. There are many alternatives around. Compile time checks are, are rule. Uh, are very important, are performed throughout the system, uh, even in areas that look like flexible, uh, for example, generics or, or other areas. There are ways to go beyond type safe and compile time check using reflection and runtime type information though. It offers a complete object-oriented programming paradigm with all of the core features and adding its own flavor with properties, events, published interfaces, support for object streaming through published interfaces, and a few more things. Interfaces are have been in the language for a long time, although they're not used all over the places. I kind of encourage you, if you're not using interfaces much, to have a second look because they are actually quite powerful and so what I'm going to do right now is start with the first demo that shows uh, an adapter pattern built using uh, interfaces. This is a rather simple application that has a few visual components. And the idea behind this button is to set all objects status to 50. Now, as you know, depending if it's a label, an edit or a progress bar, the operation set to 50 is implemented with different code. Now, the idea behind this demo is to use an interface, um, which is an adapter interface, that provides some basic capabilities like setting text and setting value, regardless of the actual component. So next thing, next thing you have to do is to provide components that will uh, adapt to this behavior. What I've done here, I've actually done using um, a coding style, which is kind of a hack, but actually quite handy. Rather than replaces those components with new one, I've provided a new implementation for um, a class with the same name as the base class. This is often called the interposer coding style. The idea is I now have a new key progress bar that does implement I text and value. And the advantage of doing this rather than having T my progress bar is that I can apply this behavior to a component that's actually in the visual designer without having to replace uh, the component. So I'm plugging in these adapters and now my code can be as simple as for each component, if it supports this interface, set the value. And we can see this in action, although it's very simple. I'm setting all, all of these things to uh, 50. Again, straightforward idea that would have been quite difficult to implement without the help of plugging in an interface, a behavior, 
into different components. So this is the interface enabled progress bar. And likewise, I have, for example, an interface enabled label that behaves exactly in the same way. Again, I don't want to delve too much into the pattern, just showing a very specific showcase, very specific scenario where interfaces actually help uh, a lot. So that's really the core of the language, but the current generation object Pascal has been enhanced uh, with quite a few technologies that allow for development that goes above and beyond pure object-oriented programming. And that's with the extension of type parameterization or generic data types, code parameterization, which is anonymous methods, and some more runtime behavior with reflection and attributes. Now, if you consider the language before and after these three features um, were added, there is a significant difference. The coding styles that are available today are much more flexible, much more powerful than those that were available before these features were introduced. So if basically my point is if you're just writing standard Delphi 7 uh, code, uh, you are basically missing 50% of the language power, which is a lot. Um, now, they, not all of these features have are fully uh, used in, in all their libraries, partially in the VCL, but if you look at FireMonkey, if you look at newer libraries, they are really making their way into the entire, uh, the entire system. And again, it's up to you to leverage and use uh, those features. Um, going through a very, sim very few simple demos, again, not trying to uh, explain and describe these features because that will take an enormous amount of time. So going through four rather simple demos, and I'm not going to spend much time on those, uh, with specific scenarios for using some of the new uh, language features. Um, the first is a demo that helps you moving beyond a very common coding style, which is using string list. Now string list is fine, but honestly, it is not the ideal compared to using a specific, when, when you want to store information, compared to using a specific data structures like a dictionary. So the, the code here compares using a string list with objects attached to it to, to using um, object dictionary. Now let's look about the code to fill the, the two lists. This is actually quite similar because we can simply say list add object or dictionary add a name and an object. Now the difference in type safety becomes visible when you're actually accessing the objects. In one case, you have to cast the object back to the original type and hopefully that will be correct. In the other case, what you get from the system is already the specific element. Okay, and even if this code looks slower and more, and slightly more complex, what happens in practice is that using the dictionary, which using a hashed mechanism, is faster in terms of performance than using the string list. So what takes uh, 1.3 seconds in the string list takes a third of a second in the uh, dictionary for processing. So better speed, but even more important, a smoother integration and no runtime time checks when using a string dictionary. Second demo I wanted to show you again for generics is um, a covariant return type or a flexible return type. Now, as you know, when you're returning a data structure from a base class, there is no way you can have an inherited class that overrides the method and has a subtype as return parameter. But what we can do is 
using these non-generic classes and add them, add them generic methods. So generic methods are available for non-generic classes. You have to spell out the data type when you're making the individual function call. Or, so rather than having get, and then if it is a sub-object, do a cast, as in this case, get object as what we can do is simply say, okay, this is a dog, so we are passing back the type as parameter and we are returning an object of the specific type because it um, uses the typed parameter. But even but this is kind of odd because there's a repetition. You are asking an object of a class to return an object of the same class. So what you can do is actually having a, a generic class that works as a class factory and that can return uh, an object of a given type. So that has a generic method that returns a t-typed object. And so you can write code like the following, um, indicate the type, indicate the other constructor parameters. And this is actually very smooth to implement uh, by taking advantage of the constructor of the generic object that's available thanks to the specific declaration I've done here. That has to be a t-animal and provides a constructor. So we can actually use the generic method to create an object and uh, initialize it. Very, very focused, very specific demo, but again, something that would have been uh, slightly more difficult to obtain without uh, generics. Uh, the next demo is um, uh, uncommon use of anonymous methods for um, event handler. So here, the event handler, rather than being a standard method of a class, is actually an anonymous method. And this is my object definition, my inherited button definition, that has an anonymous notifier, send the object as parameter, as usual. And when you click on the button, it's just going to fire the uh, anonymous method. Now what's changed is the way you can assign an event handler to the method, to, to the event, uh, or anonymous event like this, simply providing the um, object as parameter. The, sorry, providing the um, anonymous method as value for the, uh, for the event handler. Now, this doesn't make much difference compared to implementing it in, in, in a standard, more traditional way. So we're just making an assignment and then saying sender as t, sender as t button. And we'll have um, a code like this, assign and invoke. Okay, but notice that we can actually do st something slightly different. If we look at this code here, it keeps a reference to the component that actually was clicked when we did the assignment, the event handler assignment. So there is a sender, which is the component for the event handler, and there is this component reference, which is the reference of the component that's the sender in this piece of code. So at the time we are assigning. So the extra, the extra feature is that given an anonymous methods capture the invocation context, we can actually keep information about the status of something else rather than the uh, event handler uh, invocation time. Uh, so I know the example is a little convoluted, but the point is here, I press this button, I assign something to invoke, and then when I press invoke, I have a reference to invoke, and I also have a reference to the button that was used to assign the event handler. And that's because this component reference is captured by the uh, anonymous method uh, at uh, assignment time. This information stays around, this variable stays around even long after this event handler expires because it's captured by the anonymous method. That adds a huge amount of power to these uh, mechanisms compared to traditional event handlers. Last thing, and again, very shortly, I don't really want to delve into uh, too much detail here. This is a class that help, can save 
data objects into XML and I do have a main form that I can use to create some objects, a person and a company and basically save them to uh, XML. Now the traditional standard um, Delphi way would have been to um, just take a class and possibly hooking through the um, streaming mechanism of the old of the published events with the old RTTI, which is absolutely complex and cumbersome. You have to allocate memory for your properties, really use pointers and low level operations onto your data structures. By using RTTI, we can really make that code much smoother. We can decide if we want to look at properties or even stream pri private fields if we want to. We can check if a field is an instance and um, record, do recursion into the sub-object or just split out the value of the object. It does basically the same thing, but at a much higher level uh, using these uh, standard classes. Now, the, what is, you can further customize is using attributes to decorate these classes, indicating that you actually want to have the XML of some value, or you can omit this attribute to say you don't want to display anything about a given element. And also you can customize the, in this case, the XML tag that comes along with the data structure. So for example, F name, actually want to have an XML tag that's a company name. And this is done by interspersing the code with a text for the XML attribute, which is just a text that navigate through the structures and looks if the XML attribute is set on the given uh, field. Or once the uh, uh, field is, figure, is found, actually use the uh, attribute name for the uh, string tag rather than the standard, uh, rather than the standard uh, attribute name. So this checks the attribute and fills the string tag name with the value passed as parameter. As a result, we can go from, well, the old traditional publish mode to an RTTI based um, publish that's kind of dumb because just displays everything as it is to an XML that can be driven by the attributes you use to decorate the actual classes. So that's a quite powerful mechanism for uh, your handling and customizing our runtime time information. There are other minor features that have been added over the last few years you might have missed, including class constructors, exit with parameters and uh, extracting an object from an interface. Again, very short demo here. Um, this is the code of a class constructor. Not even going to run it, I guess. Just class constructor create, class destructor destroy, or you can actually give it any name. These are being executed at initialization and finalization time. So they're not executed when the object is, cre is created and destroyed, but before the class is referenced uh, in the code. Uh, the other very short demo I wanted to show is this ability, given an interface and given an object, to extract the original object from the interface. Now the scenario is, I have an interface that has a do something method and an object that, have, that has do something and do something else, which is not in the interface. Here I have an interface reference and in the past would have been quite tricky to go back and get back to the object and call the other method. Now it's as simple as calling, uh, using the as method, the as operator to get back to the object if it is an object of that type that implements the interface, otherwise you have an exception. Uh, class helpers, uh, originally added for classes and now available also for uh, records and for intrinsic and nat native types. Uh, the 
very nice feature about using them for intrinsic type is that they allow for a, what is called a fluent interface support, concatenating um, helper methods. And honestly, it's quite nice to avoid having to go back to into the string and just grab any object, any element, any native object, and just apply the two string operator to it. So this is a very simple example of um, class helper. It's a class helper for the tlistbox class that adds a needed function, which is the function that returns the string of the currently selected item. The code of the function itself is quite trivial, but now that we have defined it as a class helper, we can simply say listbox1 and ask for the uh, items index uh, value. So like if this was part of the original um, original class. So we, what we can do with the class helper is actually add a method to uh, an existing class. The only, the only issue is you can have multiple helpers for the same class within the same, within the same scope. So that's some uh, limitations. Now, a similar concept, although different in nature, has been... Now, a similar concept, even if different in nature, has been applied to um, native types, so you can now apply methods to strings or apply methods to actual integer values um, even to the point that you can say integer to string, i to string, but even 400,000 to a string with a constant or a constant of different types. Similarly, there is a string helper that has uh, a lot of methods um, that actually is very smooth to use. Um, and you can concatenate these operations. So for example, here I have a string, I extract a substring, which is still a string, I compute the length, which is an integer, and I convert the integer to string, all using this um, fluent interface or concatenating the uh, method's results. Nothing very strange here, but that's, but that's the uh, concept that really makes this uh, interesting. So now let's me get to something specific to XC7, which is the dynamic arrays. Uh, this is a brand new feature in XC7. Uh, what you can do is to mix constant, static, and dynamic arrays, and do dynamic arrays concatenation. There are also specific RTL functions for dynamic arrays like insert and uh, delete. A couple of other things to remember. First is, this is not only for basic types, integer strings, you can have dynamic arrays of anything, and I'm going to show a very simple demo. The other thing is that when a dynamic array refers to objects, then remember that unless you are on mobile, those objects are not managed uh, in memory, um, and so you'll have to get rid of those objects. Dynamic arrays themselves are reference counted and are uh, managed in memory, but not their content unless the content itself is automatically managed. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that while there is concatenation support for dynamic arrays, I would strongly uh, avoid using uh, dynamic arrays concatenation in, in something like a closed loop, a long loop, like for 100 items, go through and add this bit to a dynamic array. That's very inefficient because the array memory has to be reallocated likely every time uh, potentially copying the information back and forth. So this is not as efficient as, for example, a string-based concatenation that can take advantage of a couple of extra low-level tricks. So don't use them for uh, long loops. Uh, just call set length and assign the values directly if you know how many you need. But for in many other scenarios, that's a nice technique. So this is a simple dynamic arrays demo. Um, this shows how you can uh, initialize a dynamic array with a list of static values, concatenate dynamic arrays, or mix a dynamic array with a static one in 
um, concatenation. Uh, so mix static and dynamic values. Of course, you can always navigate through dynamic arrays using for in loop rather than the more traditional uh, for. You can also new, use the new insert and delete methods to, well, not new, but overloaded, if we can say so, insert and delete operations on uh, dynamic arrays. So we, you can insert this new item, this new fragment into a dynamic array at this position or delete um, one or more items from a dynamic array from uh, starting at a given uh, position, in this case, the third element uh, of the array. Again, the output is not probably even worth looking into that much. This is the concatenation of one, two, three, twice, plus four and five. And this has the extra items deleted and, and removed. Now, as I was mentioning, you can do more than just, than just arrays of integers or st standard types. For example, this is an array of three buttons of my four that already exists, so there's no memory management issue here. And just go through and assign a few buttons to an array. And you can technically, like for example, add another dynamic button, a dynamically created button to the array with this uh, notation. You still need the square bracket, you're adding an array of one element to the existing array. But that's actually quite smooth. Again, don't do it in, in a very long loop, but if a direct operation, that's actually quite handy rather than calling set length, length plus one, and then going to length minus one position and save uh, a button object in that uh, memory location. And while, well, yeah, adding a star to the caption, so let's see it. Uh, this goes in and adds stars to all of these uh, buttons. Last thing that I want to mention, even if it's limited to the mobile side only of the compiler, is automatic reference counting, or ARC. Um, it has, it's a very powerful mechanism to track object reference and when there are no more pending references to an object, just remove the object from memory. Uh, now it looks simple, but it is not. There are a couple of rather complex uh, elements that are part of it. One is the ability to use weak references to break cycles. If you have two objects referring one to the other, their reference will never go to zero because they keep referring to each other even if they are completely unreachable from the rest of the application. Now a weak reference lets you break a cycle and uh, manage that scenario. Uh, but weak references are tracked. This adds a little bit of overhead, but there's really nothing you can do behind, behind that model. Uh, either you go for a full garbage collection or if you have weak references, there needs to be tracking because what happens is that those references have to be set to nil when the corresponding object is uh, removed from memory. A very simple demo of ARC. This is a simple class with, um, that, with constructors and destructors that show they're being called. Nothing special. And what you can do is simply create the object and use it and then when it goes out of scope, the object will, uh, in fact, be uh, automatically uh, destroyed. Similarly, if you um, want, you can do a try finally so that the code remains 100% compatible with the known uh, ARC scenarios with the same application running on Windows and Mac, for example. In this case, it's, it's perfectly fine. What happens is that when you're calling free, you are executing the destructor, but the memory is still going to be disposed or completely unallocated when you get to the end of the code. But the behavior, destructor call and destructor side effect that happens uh, on the free call is uh, identical to what you'll see on a desktop application. There is another snippet here. You can even force again, only on the arc side, force an object to nil to have it uh, actually destroyed. Don't do that on the desktop because that's not true. You're just losing uh, the reference in that scenario. That's easier when you have simple classes. Now things get more complex when you have 
uh, weak references. For example, here there is uh, there are two classes, my little class and my complex class, that just refer to each other. So my complex class has a reference to little, and little has a reference to the complex class that owns or refers to it. Of, and the constructors and destructors are used to connect the weak and the strong um, object together. Okay, now the issue here is that you have to put a little bit of attention when you're using uh, these references. So again, this is how everything is set up. The complex class creates the internal class and has a weak reference back to itself. Now what you can do is create one, do something, and both objects will be automatically freed and removed from memory as long as they go uh, out of scope. You can force getting it out of scope. Uh, notice that at this point the weak reference will have the reference to the main object, uh, the weak reference to the main object, uh, set to nil automatically. So before using it, uh, before using a weak reference, you might want to check if that's not nil. Even if you expect it to be assigned, because for example, it's assigned in a constructor, it might go away uh, behind the scenes. So that's, the, that's one of the key points in um, using uh, weak references. What you can do also is to protect the access to the object with some, uh, with a function. This is just more of a display function to explain what's, what's going on. You might want to use um, um, a function or a property to access the weak reference so you can check if the uh, reference is actually nil and then either raise an exception or do uh, add some specific behavior to uh, your code. That's the last thing I wanted to mention. Again, a great language, kept a bit secret out there in the developers community. It is the power behind Delphi, uh, the original Delphi and the current Delphi. It's now supported by six Embarcadero compilers for different platforms and operating systems and target CPUs. And last but not least, there is a new book I'm writing on the language and you can get the current PDF draft roughly 70 to 60% of the final book. The PDF is available today if you are a registered user of XC7. It's just a free uh, download. Any question now if you are at the live session at CodeRage, otherwise feel free to reach me over uh, email. Oh, sorry. Maybe I muted myself by mistake. Sorry. I think you muted uh, so yourself. So no, when we say mobile, it's actually the mobile compilers. Oh. We have two different technologies. One is the traditional compilers, and one is the mobile compilers based on the LLVM architecture. And in the future, will there be a Linux compiler as well? Uh, that's something we are uh, considering for the future, yes. Now, which technology will be based on is still under investigation. Oops, I sent that to the wrong one. When will the desktop compilers support ARC? Uh, that's an interesting question. The um, Technically, it's not terribly difficult. Uh, actually, we do have a desktop compiler that supports ARC. That's the compiler that we're using for the iOS simulator. It's still based on the traditional compiler architecture, but it does support automatic reference counting. Now, the issue is that uh, it does introduce some severe incompatibilities. And while FarmMonkey is ARC enabled and our runtime library is ARC enabled, the VCL is not ARC enabled today. And most of the existing VCL components might get into trouble uh, compiling on, on Windows if we provide ARC as the only option. Now, one possibility would be to compile, to have ARC alongside, but then mixing and matching unit would become uh, a little more complicated. So uh, there are a couple of directions on the desktop compilers. One is ARC, the other is fully supporting LLVM. 
there are both advantages and disadvantages going in those directions. So we consider over time uh, how to uh, how to proceed. For now, the uh, desktop compilers will stay without ARC and with the traditional memory model. Okay. So I guess there's a few questions here about the um, the the bonus pack as far as like Castalia and your book and stuff like that. Yeah, someone noticed I was actually using Castalia in the demos. That's why the, the, there are lines between the begin and the end. Uh -huh. uh, that's that's uh, Castalia in action, and you can get it for free uh, if you uh, move to XC7 and. Uh, Similarly, there is my book uh, available as is registered as a download. It has the chapters on, um, well, some of the core chapters in the language. There is coverage for anonymous methods and generics. The RTTI sections and others are still being cleaned up and will be available in the future, in okay. the near future, hopefully. Um, there is another question actually I saw and I wanted to answer it was about, um, support for operators for regular classes compared to um, operators overloading for records that's been in the language for some time. Now we do have class operators for the um, mobile LLVM based compiler. The reason is because we have ARC, because if you don't have ARC uh, or a memory or a garbage collection or a memory manager, it becomes extremely complex to support operators. Like suppose you have an operation that lets you add two classes and you say A plus B to add the two objects. The result is a new object, then you have to dispose. Now that's doable. But when you start concatenating and say A plus B plus C plus D, you have like two or three intermediate temporary objects that no one is going to take care of. And these are easily memory leaks. So for general operator support, you need to have either a memory managed type like a record or uh, a comprehensive memory manager like uh, ARC or a garbage collector. So maybe we have operator overloading for interfaces? Uh, well, uh, that would be tricky, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Um, Says so I use TSTS tree a lot in my Delphi 2006 apps and depend upon the support of it or something I like it in order to upgrade. I see Async Pro is the in the new deal, but didn't see Sys tools. Any plan for also upgrading Sys tools for Delphi 2000 or Delphi XC7? That's a library we are considering. Again, it's it's. We don't directly do the work. We work with some third parties and, and help them and push them. Uh, but uh, so it's like a joint a joint effort. And um, uh, certainly SysTools is something on our radar and uh, it would be nice to have available when new version ships. Yeah. I have, it seems like I saw SysTools was updated at one point, so it's not that far back, I don't think, but. Was updated some time ago, yeah, but not but not very recently. Not very recently, okay. Um, I don't know how much of it would actually work on mobile because I mean not a sync pro, but some of the other libraries like the um, Abrevia, the compression library, is now available also on mobile. Yeah, no, yeah, that's nice. On, yeah. uh, uh, says I have an app that contains sensitive information like credit card numbers. I noticed that string manipulation on strings causes many copies of the string to appear in memory, making it easy for hackers to scrape data from memory. What is the best way to minimize memory occurrences of sensitive data? Um, I'd question. say probably don't use strings, but use things like a string stream or some of the uh, slightly more comp or uh, create, um, for example, if you need to write to a string and have full control, you can use, um, um, String builder, T string builder class, similar to the .NET string builder concept. Uh, it's more, it's easier to handle the memory in those scenarios than by doing standard string manipulation. Yeah. Or for example, yeah, using a custom custom stream and then the re text reader and text writer 
So you can actually do compression encryption or anything, even in memory, if you want to, but keep using a standard interface for reading and writing the information, like from, from a database or from other sources. Yep, that'd be something you'd want to be really careful with. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a whole bunch more questions down here that came in. They keep coming. Uh, anonymous methods. When one anonymous method calls another anonymous myth method with basically a nested method, does the compiler check that in um, what happens in that situation? Is there... Uh, basically, if you have an anonymous method within another one, you end up having a single storage structure, uh, so a single capture of the um, data, and then the two anonymous methods are somehow folded one into each uh, into the other, uh, technically. I do have, have actually a demo with three nested anonymous methods um, in one of my books, and that's uh, it's basically a single structure with uh, multiple entry points, but it's a single, single memory allocation for the anonymous method. And again, the three anonymous methods in that case would uh, share the storage. Okay. Um, we're about to move from Delphi 7 to XE7, and we would like to replace Web Broker with something PHP based. Is there functionality in XE7 that would allow interfacing with PHP from, a, from the web front end? Uh, well, sure. If if you want to create a client for PHP, you can just use uh, either plain HTTP components or the REST client library to hook and connect to those uh, to those libraries. I think it's talking about creating a PHP web front end that talks to a Delphi backend, maybe. Uh, that's also possible. You can expose. Um, HTTP entry points in multiple different ways in Delphi using web broker, using custom HTTP servers, using uh, EMS, using DataSnap. Uh, there are quite a few options. Um, I'm on software assurance, but haven't installed XE7 yet. Will I be able to get the book? Your book, uh, no, you need to install <laughs> and register the software to be able to to con be considered a registered user, as far as I know. So, uh, it's reporting someone's reporting a refactor issue. If your source code can takes, contains actuated characters, I'm sure, if you've heard of that one, it causes the ID to crash. Apparently, make a QC entry. Um... Okay. Um, no, I haven't seen. I haven't seen that yet. Let us know. I actually do have code with Accenture Charter as well because my last name has one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, has there been any thought to having a that that is inter i that is lower than interface or I/O known? that does not have add ref or release so that we can use interfaces easier without being forced to have reference counting? Um, no, there is currently no plan to have uh, interfaces that don't rely on the original architecture that, that came to Delphi from COM. Now, having the reference counting structure um, is, is something that's compulsory, but having reference counting is absolutely not required. Uh, you can just um, create your own class that implements uh, at ref and release by doing nothing. This is, for example, what T-Component does. Uh, for example, in the first demo that I did by adding interfaces to components, those components are not reference counted at all. Uh, but yes, there are at ref and release calls uh, that will consume some uh, fractions of microseconds uh, that that is wasted. But be, be, uh, beside that, you don't have to do reference counting for interfaces. You can easily disable it by having uh, do nothing at ref and release methods. I know a, 
I know now about the limitations of ARC class operators, et cetera, into the language. Question is, is there a timeline on it being introduced? They will be required eventually anyway. So is there a timeline on introducing ARC and class operators into desktop? That's that's something we will consider. It's it's not something we are working on today. So for now, it would be just a speculation. Uh, but it's something we discuss a lot. Uh, again, both taking some of the features and moving to full uh, LLVM. The C++ builder side is actually moving to full LLVM throughout. It's already available in Win64 bit, and it's going to move to full LLVM throughout all uh, platforms. We are evaluating uh, uh, what to do for the Object Pascal compiler side, but there is not a, an imminent change uh, coming. One of the reasons not to move fully on LLVM is that there is a slight drawback in compiler speed, which is roughly 10 times as long. That would not be a great, <laughs> a great uh, feature to slow down compilation 10 times. And also both linker and debuggers are still a little behind what uh, our customers are used to. So looking forward, tracking what LLVM is doing with the various projects, linkers and debuggers included. Um, but for now, we are not moving in that direction. Uh, eventually in the future, yeah, we will fully align all compilers. So there was a question if we had plans to support ORM frameworks, which I sent them a link to TMS's ORM framework, which is one of a few out there. Um, yeah, there are a few uh, available for now, uh, both in practical terms of when we've done surveys, we see only a small number of our customers uh, interested. There are several options. There have been several options from instant objects that's probably 10 years old to many new others. Um, it's, it's a nice technology, it's a technology I've used uh, personally and I like, but it doesn't look like it's universal in terms of uh, every customer wanting to, to work with that model. So there's a question if there's been any updates or modernization to the case statement. Uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Actually, I would be uh, very happy to have a um, case statement based on strings like other languages have. Um, it's something that we could certainly consider for the future. There are other directions in the language that we are pursuing. For example, the increasing type helpers can be seen as a sort of prelude to having fully managed uh, types. Uh, of course, we'll do that by keeping the current performance and, and native nature, but still um, the ability to consider uh, native types from the traditional perspective, but also from an object perspective uh, is uh, quite nice. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be nice to have that for that. Uh, it says, why didn't you take all the turbo power set into maintain inside Delphi wings? Isn't that a good idea? Um, that's a possibility, but um, I, I'm not sure if we're going to go in that direction right away. Okay, sure. There's lots of things we'd love to do, but only so much time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a matter of choice. Like uh, either we add a couple of new language features or we support a new platform like uh, Android Intel or we support another platform like Linux or we move uh, full speed ahead for into 64-bit on some of the uh, mobile national platforms. So we, we cannot do everything. We have to uh, pick and choose what, what, most re what we feel is most relevant and what our customers tell us uh, is most relevant. Uh, so, speaking of other platforms, what about Windows Phone? Uh, Windows Phone is quite a tricky platform for from two sides and hasn't actually changed over the last year. It remains a really, really small platform. Um, I think actually over the last year, it went from 4% to 3%, so actually went backwards a little bit in terms of global market share, although it's doing well in some specific countries and regions. The other side is that from the purely technology perspective, 
uh, Windows Phone doesn't actually have a way to support uh, native compiled code unless you use uh, Visual C++ and have specific permission from Microsoft to ship um, runtime native runtime libraries along with your platform. So it's kind of a tricky scenario from the technical perspective, but still it's also not the most um, popular platforms platform today. And of course it might change, but it was supposed to change last year. And now I'll see with the Nokia acquisition if Maxwell can really push that platform a little more. Um, a question about books uh, for mobile application development with Delphi. There are any coming? I know that there is one coming in Portuguese, and we are trying to push to get a, an English translation of that book. Oh, yeah, actually, uh, I, I heard they're planning to translate that one. A, a book that has some uh, snippets and some uh, demos about mobile development, although the book is not fully on mobile. Uh, there is quite a bit of information on it. Yeah, so uh, Daniel TT Book, he has a good one on Fire Monkey that was just out. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's like Fire Monkey Recipes or something like that. I can't remember. Um, there's, I think there were some blog posts about that. But yeah, there's a few few books. Like you said, there's more books uh, this year in Delphi than there have been in the past few years combined. Um, okay, I think we're getting close to time here. Um see if I've missed. It would be extremely useful if we can make calls into DLLs, object methods that were compiled in C++ as easily. We can make calls to C standard procedures and functions in DLLs. Um, yeah, it would, but it's a bit tricky because of the way Mangling works in different languages uh, like C++ and Object Pascal. Yeah, Daniel TT's Delphi cookbook, that's the one. Um, check, check that one out. That one, I just got my copy and, uh, for a good book on fire monkey. Okay. I think, oh, here's another one on UML two, uh, changes in UML two, like more options to design flow lanes and communication. Um, I guess integrated in Delphi for modeling purposes. Yeah, that's something we're not really pushing a lot into these days. Uh, although that's part of the product. The UMS board. Thanks a lot, Marco, okay, for the great session. Bye, and talk to you tomorrow. All right. Yeah, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.